back through the early um, planning documents, we see a real vision for acquisition of these large green spaces. You've probably seen this large, elegant bird. It stands around in shallow water just waiting for lunch to appear. We've been facing a serious erosion problem. Hi and welcome to the Sustainable Region. I'm Kaljeet Kayla. I'm at Campbell Valley Regional Park in Langley. It's one of the GVRD's biggest, 535 hectares in all. Everything is here, from picnicking to a wildlife demonstration garden and even horseback riding. There are 20 kilometers of hiking trails that crisscross this area and an 11 kilometer trail that hikers share with horses. That's the thing about these regional parks. They're multi-purpose. There's lots of things for visitors to do. There are 21 regional parks like this one throughout the GVRD. In today's show, we will also take a look at several municipal parks in the Lower Mainland. Reserves and greenways are a little different from parks. They don't offer the same number of public activities, but they're all part of the GVRD parks mandate to preserve and protect riparian features, to provide educational programs to the public, and to expand outdoor recreational activities. It's a policy the GVRD is committed to maintaining. Bowen is a small forested island half an hour from downtown. There's been no shortage of people you know, moving here. Over the last six years as a municipality, uh, we've acquired six or seven uh, parks. And really the hope is, or the plan is, that those uh, develop uh, or are linked together to create a network. This is the trailhead to Quarry Park. And this was a piece of land that had been through a lot, it had had a lot of ecological damage, uh, and that's how the Bowen Island Conservancy got involved. We helped to sort of restore the property and bring it back to being um, uh, stable in terms of its slopes and to be replanted again. And now it's a municipal park that lots of people enjoy. About a quarter of city of Burnaby's land base is in park. I guess the city's always seen the benefits of um, parkland in an urban setting, which is why we've spent over $100 million on parkland acquisition over the last 30 years or so. Uh, and if you go back through the early um, planning documents, we see a, a real vision for there being acquisition of these large green spaces over time. Um, so in the 60s and the 70s, they were just ideas on a map. The neat thing about thinking about greenways is that you're taking a bigger picture, you're taking a bird's eye view. People can move through them, animals, birds, even wildflower seeds and spores of ferns and mushrooms and things. All those things can ramble around. It's really kind of a network and we're hoping eventually to have uh, bits of greenway that run into and through every neighborhood. So that makes it much more pedestrian friendly too. I just I wanted to ask you again, how long do you think you will take for the uh, rezoning application? We have a park plan. We want to change that park plan to a, a greenway strategy. So you know where the next piece of land is you need, or the next five pieces of land. The short trees are in Quarry Park, but the tall trees beyond mark the edge of a crown parcel that we're hoping to protect next, as the next link in the Greenway. And that parcel connects to Cape Roger Curtis, a big property down at the water's edge, and that connects to the sea. We acquire our lands in a number of different ways. We have had city lands originally uh, in our municipal uh, land base that we've dedicated to parks. Um, secondly, we have lands that we um, have identified as being important. As these properties have become available uh, on the uh, private market, the city's bid and has acquired those lands. Uh, a third type, we've worked with the developer to be providing to us some of the lands that we want for recreational or ecological purposes. 
These acquisitions can be funded uh, either through the general uh, development cost charge we provide to all residences. So when we have new homes, uh, they provide funds and then the, those funds go to acquire um, parks. Or we use capital reserves, uh, so monies that have been set aside that the city has, for example, casino funds. We've had an open water course policy in Burnaby since 1973. Um, so we do have a lot of those riparian streamside linkages between our parks areas. Uh, but we, we, we will be wanting to carry on building on those, um, either through park acquisition or through working with uh, private land stewardship uh, to ensure that there's ecological connectivity. There is a cost in, in the sense of, of providing additional uh, housing units to developers. Uh, but we, in terms of, of dollars and cents, impact on the budget, it's been very modest. We've moved away from restrictive covenants as a means of creating the green space we want. Um, too hard to enforce, way simpler if you just own the land. We've got huge development pressure on the island right now and there are some property owners, particularly with waterfront property, that don't want anything to do with the public coming between uh, houses and waterfront, for example. So that's going to be a hard nut to crack. The goal, I think, looking 50 years down the road is that the forested backdrop of the island is still sort of that wonderful feature that it is today. Enter the Sustainable Region's Home Sustainability Challenge. Tell us what you are doing to make your home more sustainable and you will be entered into a draw to win this home sustainability kit. The kit includes low flow shower heads, a thermostat timer, energy saver light bulbs and much more. Call us now at 604-436-6794 or email us at sustainableregion at gbrd.bc.ca to enter. Hi, we're back at Campbell Valley Regional Park. With so many mountains in BC, this marshy flatland provides an important habitat for migrating birds. Campbell Valley Regional Park is a strategic part of the Pacific Flyway. And in the wintertime, this area supports Canada's highest density of shorebirds, waterfowl and raptors. Keeping tabs on the park's wildlife is one of the many things the GVRD's park interpreters do. You'll find them leading tours or pointing out birds and animals to visiting school children. Next up, the GVRD's Cal Martin takes us on the search for the great blue heron. Welcome to Burnaby Lake Regional Park. These reeds and grasses are the cafeteria for the bird that I'm going to learn about today. Hi, I'm Cal Martin, park interpreter for the GVRD. You've probably seen this large, elegant bird. It stands around in shallow water just waiting for lunch to appear. It's the great blue heron. They're often sighted around Greater Vancouver, so it's hard to believe that they're federally recognized as a species of special concern. Today I'm joined by heron expert Dallas Epp. Dallas, these are a special subspecies, aren't they? Yes, they are. The herons found along the coast of BC are different from those found in the rest of Canada. They don't migrate and uh, there are some subtle differences in their feathers. In all of BC there's maybe 4,000 breeding adults and about uh, most of those live in only 40% uh, of the colonies. So what happens in those few small areas can affect the greater heron population as a whole. Is that why they're considered a species at risk? Yes, it is. That's part of the reason. They were designated a species of special concern by Kosowick in 1997. That's the uh, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. I can show you what a large herring looks like, but in the meantime, let's go check out their feeding habitat. Sounds good. Oh, there's one. Straight ahead. Let's not go any closer so we don't disturb it. So what kind of food are they looking for? Well, they're mostly looking for fish, but really they'll eat anything that they can swallow. Um, amphibians, reptiles, even insects. 
and in the winter especially, they'll eat small mammals, rodents like mice, rats and voles. Do they fly with their food? No, they, they actually swallow it whole. They have this great arrangement with their neck bones so that uh, they can swallow large pieces of food whole. That also allows them to curve their neck into that specific S shape. So when they're flying, their necks are curved back and with their large wingspan, they look like pterodactyls. They do. And their nests are huge too. They keep them within a few kilometers of the feeding areas and up in trees as well. I know, people are surprised that they're up in trees. The birds look really gangly when they're standing high up in the trees. Let's go have a look at that heronry I was telling you about. Sounds good. This is amazing, 170 nests. Yeah, it is pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, in 2001, when they first started here, there were only a half dozen nests. And right here in Urban Stanley Park. You know, in the meantime, it's quiet now during the winter months, but come March and April, when the birds come back and start nesting and laying their eggs and hatching the chicks, it gets pretty noisy around here. Um, they usually hatch three to five eggs in uh, April, and then by the chick's fifth week, they're already learning how to fly. I understand that only about 20% of the chicks survive their first year. Well, actually, um, it's not even that. Only about 20 to 30% of the birds that live to fledge, to leave the nest, survive. A lot of them perish before that. They, they fall from the nest or get pushed out of the nest during flight practice. And uh, the reasons for the first year mortality are generally starvation and predation from birds such as eagles. And Did that's something else that we're keeping an eye on because the, the eagle population in the area has also been increasing. So do the eagles take the chicks from the nest when the adults are gone? Actually, they'll come in and attack even if the adults are present. And if it happens often enough, well, the uh, nest might be abandoned. Some of the other things that might cause the herons to abandon are unusual disturbances such as construction or chainsaw noise. But they seem to be accommodating in this relatively calm park. Herons can travel several kilometers from their nests to search for food. Now that their territory is fairly urbanized, they are highly dependent on green spaces that are protected from development. Most of the coastal heron population shares the same space as BC's human population. That's right, Cal, and we all sh share the same resources too. The trees, the fish, and the shoreline. How is the heron population doing? Well, in recent decades the population has been pretty low, but it seems that lately they've been a little more stable. But with the human and eagle populations increasing, we have to be pretty vigilant. Um, when it comes to the herons, what humans do or don't do can make a big difference. Good point. Well, thank you so much, Dallas. And thank you, Cal. Well, that's our look at the coastal great blue heron. Remember, no matter where you live in the Lower Mainland, there's a regional park just waiting to be explored near you. For the GDRD, I'm Cal Martin. Find out about sustainability in action at the GVRD's website, gvrd.bc.ca. Learn how the GVRD is integrating economic, social and environmental perspectives and working to build a sustainable region. Here in Greater Vancouver, we have Canada's best water, but did you know that it is also the softest? Because of our fresh, clean, mountain-fed reservoirs, our water doesn't carry much of the minerals like calcium and magnesium that other cities in Canada have. And that's a big advantage, because it means we can use about half as much soap to get the same results. The directions on detergent packaging are written for water conditions across the entire country, for water that is, on average, much harder than ours. By using less detergent, not only are you saving money, but you're also being kind to our local waterways, because all those extra suds that don't clean your clothes end up in our rivers and oceans. So, the next time you're doing your laundry or washing the car, the dog, or your dishes, try the Use Less, Save More experiment and see how little soap you can use.
buildings are a unique feature of GVRD parks and the Campbell Valley Regional Park has more than most. This restored farmhouse was originally built in 1898. The owner paid his master carpenter, get this, a dollar a day plus board to build it. Guess contractors worked a little cheaper in those days. The GVRD acquired the property in 1973. Up until then it was a working farm. Rather than let the building fall down, the GVRD combined forces with the Langley Heritage Society and together they restored everything to give visitors an idea of what farming looked like in early Vancouver. Upkeep and maintenance is an ongoing process at any GVRD regional park. Bray Island in Langley is one of the few campgrounds in the Lower Mainland. A recent partnership that brought together the Kwantlen First Nation, a development company and the GVRD has made the waters around Bray Island a little better for wildlife and canoeists alike. This is the best location east of Dee Slough. This Bedford Channel is really protected between Bray McMillan Islands and Fort Langley. This will be the main recreation area with uh, the playground for the kids. Right now we have campsites that utilize the riverfront. So that's sort of a private space when you're using a campsite. What, we, what we're doing is taking all those waterfront sites away from, from that location and making that the, the day use area. So by doing this, we've uh, decommissioned the campground on, along the Bedford shoreline, but actually we've opened it up to about, we estimate by 2011, 200,000 users will come and visit this area just for the day use facilities. We have three phases for development. Uh, the first phase is the major phase and that's the one we're going to start in January this year. And uh, it's certainly the bulk of our expenditures on the site and it's what introduces day users to the park. we've been facing a serious erosion problem just because of simply because of where we're situated um, in the Fraser River. We felt the uh, raising of the grade would add some benefits to the development itself and also we saw the community benefit of improving the Bedford Channel and we really wanted to make our development fit in with the community of uh, Fort Langley. Bedford Channel. We're just upstream from uh, Bray Island Regional Park. These are the spurs that were uh, constructed just this year on the reserve to help to provide uh, a flushing action through the Bedford Channel after it had been dredged. They're just basically made out of uh, large rock and the uh, spurs actually prevent erosion. Uh, just an update from Kwantlen in terms of um our work, I know we, um, through Northwest This area here is considered the special study land and there's a lot of um, history for our community that um, in many ways is unresolved and uh, there is some further discussion that 
we do need to engage in with uh, both GVRD and the township to come up with something that um, will be acceptable to um, all of our interests. Kwantlen territory is within five um, uh, municipal districts and our approach always has been to try to communicate effectively, um, try to be forthright in, in what our concerns are, um, and try to seek the best, um, most reasonable solution. Partnership building is a core part of how we work. This one has been particularly fulfilling, I think, because um, there's so much rallying around the uh, Kwantlen in terms of trying to um, support their involvement in this community. So just being able to work with the First Nations and all agencies and the public is, is really exciting. There is a lot of understanding that's required between the different groups. We look at these um, being like the meetings that we've been having as um, vehicles to provide a little bit of insight of Kwantlen, of our history, of why we have certain interests to the Bedford Channel. I just look at this as a, a journey and as a process of um, us opening up a little bit as well, um, sharing uh, a bit about who we are and through that process comes um, understanding and respect. The equestrian facilities here at Campbell Valley Regional Park are considered among the best in the area. The 11 kilometer riding trail called the Shaggy Main Trail is a meandering pathway that encircles the park. The equestrian centre is open from May to September and the GVRD will rent it out to other groups or individuals as well. Call 604-432-6352 if you're interested in booking. In our next story, Cal Martin is back. This time he's searching out Greater Vancouver's bats. Does this look like a birdhouse that's missing its opening? Well, it's not. It's a bat house, and the bats fly in right through the bottom here. Hi, I'm Cal Martin, and I'm a park interpreter with the GBRD. Did you know that we've got bats living in Greater Vancouver? Well, we do. These are bat roosting boxes behind me. The GBRD built them here in Colony Farm Regional Park in Coquitlam. About 500 bats can live here. We're not going to see bats right now because it's daytime, but I'm on my way to see more bats at Minicata Regional Park. Colony Farm Regional Park is located near the Fraser River at the south end of Coquitlam. It's about a 15 minute drive north through Coquitlam to Minicata Regional Park. In this park is Minicata Lodge and several unused farm buildings. The rafters of an empty stable house a colony of bats. I started out by learning more about this species. So these are the stables where the bats live? Yeah, the Townsend's Big Hair Bats live up there. That's great. Shannon does a lot of these bat programs. I understand that these bats are a species at risk in British Columbia. Yeah, first of all, their habitat is being reduced mm. and they're very sensitive to human disturbance. Uh, when I talk to people, a lot of people are scared of bats. Um, most people are afraid because they think bats carry rabies. And that is true, but only one in a thousand bats have rabies. That's less than one percent. And bats uh, have lots of benefits to people. Uh, bananas, mangoes, cashews are all plants that bats pollinate. Yeah, the bats that live here in British Columbia eat insects. In fact, the little brown bat that lives here at Minicata can eat 600 mosquitoes an hour. That's why I've got a bat box in my backyard. Oh, good job. You know what else you can do? What? You can keep your backyard looking natural. Don't cut down any of those old trees and try to avoid using pesticides. Well, thanks for the information, Shannon. We'll catch up with you at the program. Looking forward to it, Cal. Yeah. See you later. The Townsend's big-eared bats really do have big ears. Their lifespan averages 16 years, and their range is mostly in the United States and in the southern part of British Columbia. Shannon taught the group about bats, including the 16 different species that live in British Columbia. 
all of these people are just partaking in a GVRD interpretive program and learning tons about bats. Let's go join them. Okay. So you need to be able to recognize your smell. Okay, has everybody got a blindfold on? Yeah. Okay. Mom has to find baby by hearing that special sound. If mom recognizes the smell, then she has found baby. Is it right? Yay! <laughs> we did it. Here, let me help you. Now everybody's starting to gather by this barn where about 500 bats called little brown bats live. This is a bat detector. It picks up the high-pitched noises the bats make. If you can see, they're just starting to come out now. So let's turn and watch. Female little brown bats roost together in summer breeding colonies in hot, dark places. The summertime locations for males, on the other hand, is largely a mystery. The range for little brown bats is widespread through North America. to the stables where the Townsend's big-eared bats live. Everybody's sitting in the hallways of this empty horse stable. The bats are swooshing and flying around their heads, searching for their breakfast. I'm going to head in and join them. But remember, wherever you live in the Lower Mainland, there's a regional park to explore near you. For the GVRD, I'm Cal Martin. We hope you've enjoyed this tour of Campbell Valley Regional Park, one of 21 park sites in the Greater Vancouver Regional District. We would like to hear your comments. You can call us at 604-436-6794 or email us at sustainableregion at gvrd.bc.ca. You've been watching the Sustainable Region. I'm Kaljeet Kayla. See you next time.